guys. Uh, this is Srini, the host and co-founder of Blogcast FM. I'm guessing most of you probably know me by now. Uh, if you don't, uh, I host a show where I interview bloggers, business experts, authors, and awesome people like our friend Greg, who is actually going to be hosting the webinar tonight. Uh, this is actually the third part in a three-part webinar series. If you've missed the last two, definitely check them out. I think the recordings are available, right, Greg? Uh, the recordings are available online, absolutely. Um, okay. In fact, if you uh, go to newmethods.org slash webinars, I believe you can get there from there. Perfect. So, you know, we did that one webinar I, I, on networking, another one on productivity, all, all, both of which were absolutely packed with information that is actionable, insightful, useful. Um, and today we're, we're talking about a subject that I have would never say is near and dear to my heart, but consider a necessary evil. And fortunately, I have somebody like Greg to hold my feet to the fire and make me realize how important that is. Uh, so I'm actually very eager to talk to him today and uh, learn a lot about what he has to talk about. So Greg, uh, why don't you tell us a little more? Well, first, yeah, absolutely, Srini. And again, thank you for uh, partnering with us, New Methods, on doing this uh, webinar series here. We've got Managing cash flow as a solopreneur tonight. Obviously, as you mentioned, we did two others before this, and uh, I'm excited to get into this one because, as I remind everyone, uh, all truth is in the cash account. So you know we can talk a good game, and we can talk about how how much money we're making, or how great we are online, or how much we're doing this or that with our business. But the reality is, all truth is in the bank account. So we're going to talk a lot about uh, some cash flow strategies, techniques, and other things tonight. Uh, but what I want to focus on is not necessarily your business, but you as an individual, because you as the individual sit behind your business. So we're going to get into a lot of the things about you as a solopreneur, not necessarily the strategies for your business per se. So we'll get into that in a moment. And for those of you who don't know me, I guess uh, actually I should start by introducing myself and uh, letting you know that, again, it's Greg Hartle. I'm with New Methods. And uh, you can find us at newmethods.org. And I'm the co-founder and curriculum architect for New Methods. And my focus here is to share with you some of the strategies that we use with our students in uh, a course that we have, uh, Designing a Personal Wealth Plan. And we'll share some of those and some other things uh, about how to manage your cash flow as a solopreneur. So, Srini? Well, let's, uh, let's rock and roll. Uh, so, Greg, first thing we'll do is start off uh, with a summary of tonight's webinar. Okay, absolutely. So... Here's some things that I want to talk about. As I mentioned, I really want to get into uh, you as, a, as an individual and not necessarily just specifically your business. So some of the things that we're going to really focus on tonight is, is what do you do once your business actually starts making money? There's a million and one strategies out there for, for how to make money, and there's a million and one programs, webinars, things like that. We're not going to get into that tonight. What we're going to talk about is what do you do once you actually are making money? What do you do to improve the cash flow situation that you have? and some, some keys to securing your financial future through your business. You know, a lot of people, they equate their financial success to their business, but what they really should be doing is utilizing and leveraging their business for their own personal financial security. And then finally, you know, the most costly financial mistakes that, that we've seen entrepreneurs make and, and how to avoid them. So we're really going to dive into each of these tonight, and I uh, hope you guys love what we have to share. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's get started. Absolutely. What do we got up first, Rainey? All right. So, Greg, you say there's no better vehicle for creating wealth fast than starting and building your own successful business. But, uh, you know, at, at the core of the very first question that you even brought up in our in our introduction, what should entrepreneurs do once their business starts making money? Well, I absolutely, uh, truly believe that starting your own business is the easiest and fastest way to create wealth. Uh, you know, there's there's things you can invest in. Obviously, you can have a job. Obviously, you can you can invest the cash that you make, etc., to make money. But to create wealth, really, the business is the best thing. But what I found is that that most people haven't learned how to grow their wealth independent of their business's success. Everything ends up riding on their business. If their business succeeds, they succeed. If their business fails, they fail. And some of the things that I want to talk about tonight and the things that we cover in our, our course, Designing a Personal Wealth Plan, is to really understand how you can leverage your business for your own personal success. Because, you know, entrepreneurs, we have all these great dreams about, you know, the beaches we're going to lie on and, and the Mai Tais we're going to drink and, and, and these fantasies of all this uh, you know, amazing things we're going to do once we hit it big and become a great entrepreneur. 
where but we rarely think past that fantasy to really that that functional reality of navigating the world of wealth and and I've even seen you know many entrepreneurs over the years I've been an entrepreneur myself for 13 years I've worked with countless businesses over the years and obviously you know we create courses here at new methods and and I've seen I can't tell you how many people who have actually made a lot of money but they never really learn the wealth skills along the way to build their own personal wealth in, par in parallel with building their business wealth. And really, you know, that's absolutely crit critical. So the first thing is you have, to, you have to make the commitment that you're going to develop the skills you need, the money skills, the wealth skills that you need to also build your personal wealth in parallel with your business's, uh, business's success. So some of that that, that I want to um, talk about here is basically just first of all do you understand how money works you know most of us never received a money education you know what we learned we've learned from our parents or those around us or things we might read or see around but we've never actually learned how money works why it works what's our personal relationship to it uh, you know we've, we've never really taken the time to really understand that and what happens is oftentimes we we start a business we start making money and maybe some of us even make a lot of money but we don't know how to keep it and we definitely don't know how to grow it. So the first thing I would say to you is make that commitment right now that you're going to make a, a, a clear distinction to learn the skills necessary to understand how money works, to understand your relationship with money, and to know how to leverage your business for your own personal independent wealth. Those three things are absolutely critical. And until you make that mindset shift, often what I see and what I've seen with our students at New Methods is is people can make a lot of money but they don't save a lot of money they don't leverage that and invest that money and then money doesn't end up creating the lifestyle that they ultimately want to create what ends up happening is what we talked about in our last webinar which is they become this they be, get trapped into the self-employment trap and all they end up doing is just spinning their wheels trying to create more and more money to pay off their lifestyle instead of learning what they need to know about how to manage their money properly so it starts there with your mindset on on making that distinction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll just add a couple of quick comments to that, Greg. One of the things that you mentioned is knowing how to grow your money and also saving money. Uh, two things that I actually did in a, in a terrible way uh, when I was younger. I mean, saving makes such a huge difference, and it gives you so much more leverage. You don't make poor decisions based on not having enough cash in the bank and, and things like that. Something to think about, and I'm sure Greg will probably hit on some of these things as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a lot of leverage when you, when you've got some cash, so you don't end up doing things out of desperation and making decisions that might benefit you financially in the short term, but in the long term uh, end up being quite costly. Uh, so that's one thing to think about in terms of savings. And also in terms of growing it, I mean, one thing that I know is, and I'm guessing Greg will talk about this, is that you do have to put money back into the business, and that's something that we'll have to uh, hit on. So let's, uh, let's get into uh, understanding what the keys are to cash flow, Greg. Sure. So... Well, you know, cash flow is is the heartbeat of your business, without question. It's it's what allows your business to stay functioning. And you know, oftentimes we look at income, but we don't really pay enough close attention to the cash flow of our business. And so, the very first thing you have to do is the thing that really isn't all that sexy, but you have to understand the vocabulary of accounting. You know, none of us, unless we're accountants, probably really appreciate accounting or even like accounting. You talked at the beginning about kind of uh, the, the money part of your business being the necessary evil. I think a lot of us probably feel that way. But here's the reality. The reality is, is if we don't understand the simple basics of accounting and the simple vocabulary of accounting, it, we, we won't have a successful business. It's really the difference between a sustainable, you know, having a sustainable financial success and eventual financial failure. And it's really having that deep understanding. So first and foremost, you have to be willing to understand accounting. And it doesn't have to be like you have to become an expert or an accountant or even a bookkeeper. In fact, I don't encourage you do those things, which we'll talk about here in a bit. But what it does mean is you really have to understand what, are, what is an asset, what is a liability, what is income, what are expenses, what is the cash flow, and then also understand the, the financial statements that you're producing. I know so many entrepreneurs over the years who never produced financial statements. All they did was look at their bank account statement, right? But that's not the financial statement that you need with your business. So first and foremost, 
make the commitment that you're not going to just look at your bank balance, you're going to actually look at financial statements. So uh, in order to do that, you have to do one of the things that most solopreneurs fail to do, which is probably the most basic thing, which is you have to separate your personal finances from your business's finances. Not only is that important just to, to create sustainable financial success, it's actually wise to do that for legal reasons and accounting reasons and tax reasons as well. So number one, if you're out there you know, and, you, and you haven't made that commitment yet, that's number one. Different bank accounts for your business account, for your personal account. Different check systems, uh, uh, different you know, handling your money separately between those two accounts, making sure that you're paying for business expenses when they're business expenses out of the business account, and personal expenses out of the personal account. So that's step number one in terms of handling your cash flow properly. Secondly, for the, from there, really uh, having uh, um, reading your having financial statements and reading them correctly. So without question, you need a profit and loss statement. Now, if you're not sure where to begin on that, you, you've got a couple of options. Number one, you should use some sort of accounting software. Uh, QuickBooks, FreshBooks, you know, one of the things we talked about just recently, Srini, FreshBooks is a great tool that you could use. QuickBooks is also an excellent tool. Use a tool like that so that you can really read your cash flow situation and understand it. But if you're not going to use a tool like that, at a minimum, use something like a spreadsheet, Excel, you know, Google Docs, whatever it is. Use some sort of a spreadsheet so that you have a profit and loss statement that you're reviewing every single month. So you should be reviewing your profit and loss from the previous month, but halfway through the month, you should also be projecting your profit and loss for the next month. Now these things are boring, as I said, they're not sexy, but they are absolutely necessary. And I cannot tell you how many people I know that have started businesses, especially solopreneurs, that don't do these things, and they're constantly just spinning their wheels. And as soon as they make the mindset shift, as I mentioned at the beginning, and then they start to adopt some of these things, like separating their business uh, money from their personal money, and then number two, adopting some sort of uh, accounting software, it makes all the difference in the world. So do those two things. Third, once you have a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet that you're actually reviewing, then what you have to do is you have to read the story of what those things are telling you. See, most people look at numbers and they just see numbers. But really, numbers are telling you a story. So what is it telling you? What kind of story does it tell you about your personal finances, about your business finances? And what I'm saying there is, does it tell you you know a lot about money or that you know a little and that you need to learn more? Is it telling you that you really understand how cash flow is working or that you're really struggling to understand it? Is it telling you that you have a financial plan and you're executing it or that you're just haphazardly winging it? So really read that story that your finances are telling you. And the best way to do that is to track progress and measure it against previous progress. So if I'm looking at a profit and loss statement, I'm not just looking at it statically. I'm comparing it to the previous months and the previous months and the previous months. Because that starts to put together a story. It tells me if I'm going the direction I want to go or if I'm not. And if you look at it and you say, I'm not sure if I'm going the direction I want to go, well, then you know you don't have a plan in place. And we're going to talk about that later on. And that's obviously the point of our, our, our course that we have with New Methods is to create that plan. But if you can't figure out is, is it going the right way or not, that's probably because you don't have a plan with certain goals and metrics that you're keeping track of. So that's the next thing. Uh, and then... From there, two more things. Uh, first, have an offensive game plan for investing your money once you start having cash flow. Now, part of that is investing back in your business, as you mentioned, and then part of that is, is putting that into your personal side of things. So you should always be spinning off a certain amount of your money into personal, and that money should then be invested separately from what you've invested back into your business. Now, depending on where you're at in your cycle of your business, that will vary. Obviously, early stage business, you're probably going to need to invest more money back into your business. You know, as you start to grow and as you start to move to different levels of your business, you're going to be able to siphon some of that money off into your personal side. So as a rule of thumb, you know, depending on your, your legitimate cash flow situation and your personal needs, as a rule of thumb, right away, you're probably spinning off 5 or 10% of your money to the personal side that you're going to invest. 90% is probably going back into your business. And then at certain milestones, which you would have to decide based on your individual business and based on your personal wealth plan, you would start to shift that. So it would start to come down in 
70 percent, sixty percent, so on. You'll always, of course, have a certain percentage that you will always invest back into your business, but the percentage should start to drop over the course of time as you're hitting your financial goals, where more and more is siphoned off into your personal side. So that's where you can utilize your business by doing that. You can utilize your business to start to fund your personal financial security. And that's the offensive game plan. Now, there's a defensive game plan that you want to have as well, which is having a preemptive tax strategy. We're not going to get into all the tax and, and legal terms and things like that tonight. We're talking more about concepts tonight. But you have to have that offensive strategy because you have to be investing in your business and in yourself. But then you also have to have a defensive strategy, which is most people only pay attention to their taxes about, oh, two days before they're due. But what I would encourage you to do as a business owner is to have a preemptive tax strategy, to get with an accountant months in advance of next year's taxes and say, what should I be thinking about? What should I know? What should I do this year for next year? Right now, we're, we're in September. You should have already planned out 2013 on your taxes. So if you haven't, you know you're behind. You're behind the eight ball. So first, have that offensive game plan. Second, have that defensive game plan. So there's some key things right there in terms of understanding cash flow. These are simple concepts, but I guarantee you the majority of people are not implementing them, and that's why I'm talking about them. Great. Well, um, I like I said, I was really thrilled that you were doing this webinar because there's a lot of things here that even I'm not doing. So as you can imagine, I'm going to have a lot of work cut out for me. So, <laughs> Greg, let's uh, let's transition to the next question, which is, you know, what are the best strategies that solopreneurs can implement to improve their cash flow situation? Well, so now you're starting to to take control of your cash flow situation by by putting, you know, having accounting software reading financial statements and listening to the story, having an offensive game plan and siphoning off some of your money, having a defensive game plan, and having a preemptive tax, tax strategy. So what you really want to do next is start to look at how can you improve that. Now you know what it is, and now you can read the story, but how can you improve that? Well, there's a few things that, that you can really think about. And here's the first one. And I always kind of go back to this mindset thing because it's so important for solopreneurs especially to really pay attention to this. But the first thing is is, if you want to increase your cash flow, the number one thing you must realize is no matter how hard you work, you will never get past a certain size if your business is designed to solely maximize you. So I want to repeat that. No matter how hard you work, you will never get past a certain size if your business is designed to solely maximize you. Now in recent years, there's been a lot of talk about you know, lifestyle design type businesses. And a lot of solopreneurs fit into that category, and a lot of online entrepreneurs fit into that category. But the reality is, is that if you really want to improve your cash flow, and especially you know, on the income side of that cash flow, the first thing you have to realize is that if your business is only set up to maximize you, it's, it has a cap. It absolutely has a cap. So what you should be focused on instead is how is your business actually improving something else? How is your business not only maximizing you, but it's maximizing the world somehow? So what most people do is they focus on themselves. But if you look at any business that has reached real success, that business makes more people wealthy than anything else. Take Microsoft as a perfect example. So the reason Microsoft became really big in the late 90s was not because they were making a lot of money, but they were providing tools and resources that allowed other people to make a lot of money. And then their employees made a lot of money. And then those employees were able to create lifestyles for themselves. So anytime you can position your business to help other people be successful, whether that's vendors, whether that's the few employees that you might have, whether that's you know the, the independent contractors that you work with. So first, make that shift. Don't just think about how is this business solely designed to maximize me. Think about how it's actually helping other people. Second, have ac uh, adequate record keeping from day one. So are you actually tracking your numbers? So if you start to implement the software, it has to be kept up. So what I've also noticed is that somebody will adopt the software, they get all excited, they're like, you know what, I need to separate my business from personal, and they start using QuickBooks or FreshBooks or something like that. They get all excited, but then they fall short of keeping it up to date. So the simple answer there is you're not a bookkeeper, you're not an accountant. Hire one. One of the first positions you should hire, and I don't mean internally, but you can outsource it, 
is a bookkeeper. You should have a bookkeeper almost from day one, if possible, but as soon as possible. You and this, this seems so simple, but it's so critical. So if we're talking about strategies to improve cash flow, get a bookkeeper. Because as soon as you start keeping up to date all the time, and then you're looking at those numbers and reading the story, I guarantee you, you'll start making different decisions. You'll make better decisions on behalf of your business and on behalf of you. So get adequate record keeping from day one and get a bookkeeper on board. Outsource that. Third, set up a regular review schedule. So don't just rely on reading the numbers when you're down to you know, 10 cents left in your bank account and you got to scramble to figure out ways to make money. Put it on your calendar. We talked about this last uh, in, in our Solopreneur, Productivity for Solopreneurs webinar, where if you're wearing certain hats, business owner, uh, uh, leader, manager, and implementer, what you should do is when you're wearing that hat of business owner, you should be reviewing your finances. So if you, have a, if you set up that regular schedule in advance, you know that the first of every month or the second of every month or the first, you know, the mon Monday of every week, whatever it is, get it on the calendar where you have a regular review, review schedule. Third, make sure that you are starting to implement proper reserves. I cannot tell you how many businesses I've seen fail that make a ton of money. I'm talking tens of millions of dollars of money. I've seen them fail because of one simple thing. They did not have proper reserves. Your business will always have a downtime. There is no question you will go through a downturn. It's just a matter of when and how long that downturn will be. So as you invest back into your business, one of the first things you're doing when you're investing back in, and as you invest in your personal wealth, one of the first things you're doing there, is you're building up reserves. And one of the things we talk about in our designing a personal wealth plan is, is creating an emergency fund and a sleep well at night fund. You should really ha be able to sleep well at night knowing that if you wake up tomorrow and your business struggles for the next three months, you're still okay, both with your business and personally. So implement a proper reserve strategy. And again, that's all based on your particular business, so I'm not going to get into exact numbers that you should have, but you have to design your own wealth plan so that you have, you know that I'm going to, what makes me sleep well at night is I have three months of reserves. Or what makes me sleep well at night is I have six months of reserve in my business and three months on my personal side. Or three months on my business and six months on my personal side. So have those reserve reserves handy. Next thing, manage your accounts receivable. Most people, when I've, when I've done kind of a, a financial audit of different businesses over the years, most people have money sitting there that they haven't collected on. And they don't know how to collect on. You have to be a good collector. You have to be able to make those tough phone calls or send those tough emails and collect money that's owed to you. And I know that's not a sexy, fun part of your business either, and no one wants to do that. So again, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, we'll outsource it. But whatever you do, you've got to keep your accounts receivable up to date. You have to have all the money that's due to you, get it, collect it. Almost always, if you go past 90 days past due where money's owed to you, most likely, and, and I don't remember what the statistics are, statistics are, but they're pretty high, where if it goes past 90 days, you're most likely never going to see that money. So you want to stay up to date on making sure you're collecting that money. So again, build that into your schedule as well, that you're making the calls or sending the emails that you need to or you've outsourced it so that those things are getting done. And here's a little tip. The best way to handle accounts receivable is get paid in advance. Evaluate your business and really get a true sense of whatever whatever you're doing. Can you get paid in advance or at a minimum on time on at the time of service or delivery of product? Try to make sure that you can do that as best you can. Almost always, in almost all situations, you can at least partial payment. Whether you're designing websites or you're selling something online, whatever it is, at least get partial or coaching. Get an upfront down payment if you're a coach. Or a consultant. So at least get partial payment up front. Uh, from there, design a personal wealth plan. I, you know, most people, solopreneurs, don't have their own personal wealth plan, which we're going to talk at length here in, in, in just a moment. But you have to have your own personal wealth plan separate of your business's wealth plan so that you know you're hitting your goals and your targets, so that you know you're on track with, with where your income's coming and your expenses that are going out and your financial goals. And, and the three things you want to do when you design a personal wealth plan is you want to establish security first. So make sure that you're secure, your business feels secure, and you can sleep well at night, and you personally are secure and you can sleep well at night. 
then you move to comfortability. So then once security is, is reached, then you start saying, what are the comfortable goals I want to hit? I would feel comfortable if I hit these goals with my business and with my personal finances. And then you could start thinking about financial freedom and drinking the Mai Tais and driving the fancy car or whatever else is your, you know, your, your pick or your choice of what financial freedom means to you. But what I've seen is, is we, we, we get caught up in that side of things way too soon. Start with security, then get comfortable, then start thinking about all that fancy stuff along the way. So those are some immediate strategies that people can implement right away to improve their cash flow situation. Awesome. Tons of tons of valuable stuff there. So let's do this. Let's shift gears a little bit. And uh, since we just finished talking about uh, some of the components of a personal wealth plan, let's start talking about what a personal wealth plan consists of and why it's important. Well, that, and that's obviously the, the main reason why we're here tonight. At New Methods, we have a course called Designing a Personal Wealth Plan. And, and our students to go through it, the focus there is to really design it for their personal selves, but to also understand where their business fits in to that. Uh, and so there's, there's some things here. The first thing is, is everyone has a wealth plan, whether they realize it or not, because they're, doing, they're following some sort of method or strategy right now. Whether it's written down or not, they're following something. And Srini, you mentioned at the beginning you know, how this is kind of the necessary evil and the things you don't want to think about. Well, you are on some level, either unconsciously or consciously, following your own personal wealth plan. The question is, is it a good plan? And is it, is it written down and strategic? That's the real question. So really you have to start there. You have to ask yourself, what is my personal wealth plan? Because you have one. And then you have to say, is it good? Or, or do I need to do something about it and make it good? And then secondly from there, is, is this going to help me actually lead me to, to the financial uh, goals and, and financial success that I'm looking for? Or am I headed towards financial ruin? And so you really got to back up and start there. And then it, it really when you're designing your wealth plan, it's really a, a couple of things. It's really about understanding the barriers that keep you from managing your money well. So when we're running a business, there's a human being behind that business. And that's why we've done this Beyond Blogging series. Because you, the solopreneur, the online entrepreneur, you're behind your business. And so everything you're doing in your business is really affected by human beings, human emotions, human you know, uh, limiting beliefs, other things like that. So the first part of your wealth plan has to be about understanding the barriers that keep you from managing your money well. The second part has to be about how do you tear those down. And then the third has to be about putting your money in the right places so you can achieve your goals. So when we go through our designing a personal wealth plan uh, um, course, it does exactly that. So start with what is holding you back, then start figuring out what is it going to take, who do you need to become to tear those down, and then third, putting your money in the right places. So simple things, have a clear, have clear written financial goals. If I asked you right now, Shrini, could you tell me your top three financial goals? Could you, you don't have to say them, but could you tell me them? Actually, no. Okay. <laughs> so right there, that's immediate. We've got to correct that. We've got to correct that today. Mm -hmm. So you have to have clear written financial goals. We know statistics have been proven year after year after year. 90 per, people will achieve their goals at a rate of 90% better if they simply just write them down. So you have the likelihood that you're going to achieve your goals 97% better if you just wrote them down. So having clear written financial goals, start there. Secondly, have clear written savings and investment philosophy. What's your philosophy on money? What makes you feel secure? What makes you feel comfortable? What would actually lead you to financial freedom? What is your philosophy on investing your money back into your business or in your personal life? So what is that philosophy? Uh, next. You really have to invest your time, energy, and money in cultivating significant advantages in at least one profitable area. What most people do is they try to take their money and hand it over to a so-called expert. And they say, do something with this so that I have more money in 10 years before I die. Kind of that's the, that's the plan. You know, put it in a bank account, hand it to a financial planner, a retirement uh, account manager, and hand it over to an expert. But what you really should be doing is you should be investing your time, energy, and money to cultivate a significant advantage in at least one wealth area. So that might be your business. That might be stocks, bonds, mutual funds. That might be real estate, real estate investment property. But you have to put in the effort to create significant advantages there. If you personally create those significant advantages, then you'll start to make more money, and you'll start to save more money. You'll start to invest your money better. 
and so don't just hand it over to somebody. Actually, cultivate those significant advantages, and then uh, uh, then what you have to do is really once you have you know your your investment philosophy and your financial goals written down, you really have to have a clear written investment criteria written down. So Srini, if you were to spin off some money, say from Blogcast FM to your personal life, mm -hmm. and somebody came up to you and said, Srini, I've got a great investment. You should invest in it. Is it a good investment? Well, it's only a good investment if it meets your financial criteria or investment criteria. Most people, most solopreneurs, just most people in general, don't have an investment criteria. So you have to have the basics of an investment criteria so you can use that as a filtering system when evaluating opportunities. Once your business starts becoming successful, you start meeting a lot of people, you start knowing a lot of people, opportunities start to show up in your lap. What happens is, is most people, those opportunities end up becoming distractions more than anything else. And the reason they're distractions is they don't have clear written financial goals, investment philosophy, and investment criteria written down anywhere. So when an opportunity shows up, they can't actually evaluate it thoroughly. They're just guessing or, or basing everything on feeling. Yeah, that feels right. Let's do that. And they're darting off this direction and that direction and this direction. And then they look up 10 years from now, and they made a lot of money in their business, and they have no money in their personal life. And so to avoid that, you really got you got to get clear and have those those written goals, written philosophy, and written criteria, so that you can properly filter out things. So there's some things to be thinking about for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll make one comment on the on the filtering out piece. Uh, you know, as many of you know, if you're a listener of our show, we've made a lot of changes over the last year, and one of the big investments we've made is in David's design skills. But uh, recently, we had an opportunity that uh, came our way. And we looked at it, and we had to basically sit down and, and say, okay, do any, does it, this opportunity align to any of our, our major goals at the moment, financially or even business-wise? And when I ran it through that filter, I thought, okay, this is a complete waste of time. There's no point in continuing this, and, and that was the end of it. Yeah, no, that, and that's how it, it should be that simple. But for most people, it's really complicated. They're not sure, should I do it, should I not do it? And because they don't have anything written down to tell them, yeah, this makes sense. They don't have that filtering system. Mm -hmm. and so that's, that's absolutely critical to your success. Excellent. Um, number one, invest in yourself and your earning capacity. Without question, you are your greatest cash flow magnifier. So it starts there. Are you taking the time to invest in yourself and your earning capacity? We talked earlier about cultivating significant advantages. There's only one thing you can do to do that, and that's to get to become a better you. So start there. When you're talking about what's that first stage, invest in yourself. Are you truly learning and gaining that knowledge base you need to build your wealth independent of your business? Or are you solely relying on your business to bring in money, and if something happens, you're out, you're done? Uh, are you in a position where you're managing your cash flow well because you understand how to manage cash flow well? Are you, have you dealt with your relationship to money uh, the way that you need to so that you succeed with money? Most of us have a horrible relationship to money you know, in this country. And, and that's partly because we didn't get educated properly. And it's partly because of you know, the 9,000 million marketing messages that we see every day. And, and partly because we've been conditioned to hand our money over to people instead of really learning about our relationship with it and what we should do with it. So you really have to create that knowledge base that you need to begin to build your wealth independent of your business and understand money and your relationship to it. Then from there, you move on to stage two, which is to design a wealth plan and early stage implementation. That's where you're separating out your business finances from your personal finances, and you're learning and you're understanding the story that the financial numbers are telling you, and you're comparing different time periods of your finances. So you're looking month over month, year over year, quarter over quarter, so that you can examine, you can read that story, am I going in the right direction based on my plan, or am I going in a different direction? Then you've got to set the goals and develop healthy financial habits and habits come from skill development, and that's why we, we create these courses based on their skill base. Because we know that you won't change anything. You can read every book, you can watch, you know, read every blog post, listen to every podcast. You won't change anything until you change your habits. And so you really have to develop healthy financial habits. Then you have to develop the skills for managing your money. So a few things to consider here is when's the last time you checked on your financial habits? When's the last time you really examined your financial habits? 
And when's the last time you've really practiced the skill of managing your money? So I'd encourage you to consider those things. And that's really part of that stage, too, is getting real good at, design, at developing those healthy financial habits and really the, the, the skill for managing your money. And then add advisors. And, you know, Srini, you and I actually just talked about this before we jumped on here. One of the things I've noticed with solopreneurs, specific to wealth building, but also just to your business in general, is most people don't have advisors. They don't have a team around them. We, in, our, in our course, uh, Designing a Personal Wealth Fund, we call it creating a, a trusted resource network. There's a whole section on creating a trusted resource network. And, um, you know, one of the things you, you and I talked about, Trini, was really having advisors for you, your business, and, and who are those advisors and what do they look like. I think that's absolutely critical, a critical part of stage two of wealth building, having advisors on your team. Now, the thing about advisors is, is that you have to make sure that they're really in your corner. If, if an advisor is just a financial planner that you're paying that is getting paid because he's selling you something, that's not a real advisor. You've got to be careful that you're actually uh, implementing or, or having advisors that really have your best interest at heart. So I'd ask you to take the time uh, tonight or tomorrow, sit down and really ask yourself, how many advisors do I have on my team who are advising me on my wealth building and my business? And, and start to look for some and start to reach out to some and really uh, figure out what you need to do to add some to your team. And then you move on to stage three, which is, which is to build wealth that is independent of your primary business. Now, this is going to take time. It's, gonna, you know, it's, it's over the course of time. And we talked about over time, you should be siphoning off money, and the percentages will change. So at the beginning, you know, 90% of your money is going back into your business. Maybe 5 or 10% is going to you. But over time, that should be leveraging out or, uh, uh, leveling out and changing where more of that money is coming to you then you can use that money to build wealth independent of your primary business. So at that point, you have to implement personal financial systems along with the business financial co uh, controls that you have in place so that you're using your cash flow to grow more wealth outside of your business. And I can tell you that you know we've had students who actually end up creating more wealth outside of their business when it's done correctly and they've designed a good plan. They end up creating more wealth outside of their business than they actually do in their business. But until you start having, you know, put that plan in place, that's very hard to do. But that's really that third stage is, is to grow it independent, independent of your business. So follow those stages. The key here is, is to actually go through those stages. Most people try to jump to three, and they skip stage one and stage two. So start to implement stage one and stage two now, then get to stage three. Great. So, Greg, uh, we can do all of this, right? But one of the things that we also know is that people make mistakes. So let's talk about what the really costly financial mistakes that entrepreneurs make are. Sure, yeah. That's a, that's a great point. Now, first of all, we're all going to make mistakes. You know, we want to avoid these, but it's, it's not necessarily that we are going to avoid these. But, you know, there's, there's a lot to learn and there's a lot to do. What most people do as solopreneurs is they learn a lot about business. They read a lot of business books. They learn a lot about marketing or how to get more sales. But they don't spend nearly enough time learning about money or their relationship to it. So I would encourage you is to fit into your schedule when you're you know, reading that business book every month or those business blogs or those marketing blogs or listening to those podcasts. Also include a little bit of time to learn about money the technical sides of money, like the accounting sides, you know, all the boring stuff that no one wants to do, and then also just your relationship to it. So take the time, build that in, and really take that time. Um, that's, that's the first thing. Most don't spend near enough time on learning money and their relationship to it. Secondly, another big mistake that a lot of people wake, make is they focus solely on income in their business as the only path to wealth. So what happens is, is, is the income is feeding their lifestyle. So the income from their business ends up feeding their lifestyle. And then their lifestyle kind of grows and balloons as their business grows and balloons. In fact, this happens for people that don't even have businesses, just people that have salaries at jobs. They get a promotion and, and their personal life ballooned to the size, uh, personal lifestyle ballooned to the size of that promotion. What you want to do is realize that th this is you know proven time and time again. Actually, your income is one of the worst predictors of your financial success. Your income is one. I've seen countless people, doctors, lawyers, other small entrepreneurs that I've seen, they have made seriously tens of millions of dollars, and they're broke. They're filing for bankruptcy. 
because they never learned about money. They just learned how to make money. And they never learned about their relationship with money. They just learned marketing or sales or how to sell a product. So that's why I say, I mean, you know, I'm serious about that. You really got to take the time. And don't just focus solely on your business's income as your only path to wealth. Actually pay attention to, to siphoning some of that money off and managing it, being a steward of that properly so that you don't fall victim to, to what I've seen so many fall victim to where they've built up the successful business, but all it's doing is just feeding their lifestyle and they have no money left over uh, at the end. Uh, third, learn how to save. It really just starts there. Just basics, you know, as I talked about, you know, in our in our program, starting with an emergency fund, starting with a sleep well at night fund. Our savings rate in this country in, in, in America is really low. None of us really save any money. So we gotta start there. Start with the basics. How much money are you saving each month? Now, that's partly how much money are you saving for reserves for your business, and how much money are you saving for reserves for your personal life, as we talked about earlier. Then you really need to focus on learning how to invest that money properly. Now, again, you don't have to become an expert at this stuff, but you have to know enough to know what you're doing because you want to invest close to home. So many of us, again, hand our money over. We want to invest close to home. Then I see a lot of people, one of the biggest mistakes that I see is a lot of people pretend that they're too busy. They just say, you know what? I don't have time for that. I got to I gotta make more sales. You know, I got to go to this networking event. I you got to write this blog post. They pretend to be too busy. You're never too busy, as we talked about in our last webinar on productivity. You're never too busy. You always choose your priorities. No such thing as time management, only priority management. You choose whether or not the financial success of your business is a priority to you or not. So start there. Don't pretend like you're too busy. You're never too busy. Take the time to implement the systems you need to, the financial controls you need to, to learn about money and learn about your relationship to money. And then next, most, uh, especially solopreneurs, they don't form a team. You can really be a solopreneur and still have a team. You can have vendors, advisors, um, uh, independent contractors. Form a good, solid team. Most people try to manage everything themselves. As I said at the beginning, one of the first team members you should have is a bookkeeper. You should also have a CPA. You should stay in full control of your finances always both business and personal, no matter what. But you should have team members on your team. It starts with a bookkeeper, also a CPA. Third might be a personal assistant. Fourth are advisors. Who's advising you? So start with those four team members, and you can build out from there. So those are easily some of the, the biggest mistakes that I've seen over the years and the mistakes I've seen, with, with especially with solopreneurs. And the key is, is to avoid those as much as you possibly can. Yeah, well, Greg, uh, I, I want to, if you don't mind, I'd like to share a personal story really quick. I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet uh, sure. around this idea of saving and, and personal finance. I mean, I, I learned this lesson the hard way. Uh, I love that you brought up that point about how people's income adjusts immediately based, uh, or that their lifestyle adjusts based on their income. And I've seen this over and over, and I only know this firsthand because I did it myself. I mean, <laughs> I had a, a job uh, sometime in my early 20s when I ended up uh, working in sales at this company. And they paid out a, a significant draw to all the new sales reps. And uh, so I started living like an NBA basketball player for about a month. Uh, or, <laughs> you know, at least that's the way I thought of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. The weird thing that, about that is it came back to bite me, and it didn't happen until about 10 years later. Uh, I, I literally I, I had to move home to my parents' house, and I was broke uh, when I graduated mm -hmm. from business school. Mm -hmm. And some of those decisions actually are what led me there. But it's amazing because it took 10 years to catch up with me. Yeah, well, I, it, it, that's how it works. And that's, you know, I, if you can't tell in my voice, I'm extremely passionate about this topic because I've just seen it time. It, first of all, I've experienced it personally. Secondly, I've seen it time and time again with small business owners, solopreneurs, online entrepreneurs. If we don't take this stuff seriously, it'll bury us. It'll absolutely bury us. We have to take it seriously. Well, Greg, any final thoughts before we take questions? Uh, yeah, so anybody, I see there's a couple of questions here that I'm, I'll get to in a second, but if anybody else has any questions, feel free to shoot those questions over in the question box, and we'll definitely answer those. Um, you know, as, as far as final thoughts go, I think really the, the only thing I would want to say there is I would say at least twice a year do a comprehensive strategic financial analysis. 
So at least twice a year. If you're not going to design a wealth plan and you're going to throw out everything I've said up to this point, which is you know perfectly fine if that's what you want to do, uh, I would just encourage you to to do at least twice a year do a financial analysis on your net worth, your cash flow, your investment performance, your lifestyle costs. As Shreen just mentioned, are you living like a, a pro basketball player? And your tax strategy effectiveness. I would say at a minimum you should be looking at those things at least twice a year. And my hope would be is that you would design a plan around those things so that you could be looking at them monthly and quarterly, et cetera. But at least twice, that, that's, that'd be the biggest thing that I would say. Is there anything that you, you have questions about, Srini, or want to add, uh, final thoughts before we get into these questions here? Um, you know, it, I'm glad you brought up the savings bit because, as I mentioned, that was one of my big mistakes. And what's amazing is how simple it would have been if I had just been smart. It honestly wouldn't have – the funny thing is I probably could have kept living that lifestyle. Uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I obviously I, I kind of you know did it excessively, but believe it or not, had I just been smart enough, I mean, at that time, I don't think we had things like the ING direct savings account. That to me has been literally. Here, here's what I would say about that that piece for you guys. I mean, I I literally put that on autopilot. I don't even think about it anymore. It just gets done. Like, and that was you know one of the most valuable things I ever did in terms of my savings. Yeah, no, that's you put, and we have that built into our co in, in our course. Actually, a lot of that where you where you set up automatic systems so that you don't have to be thinking about it, and the decisions are just made for you. Absolutely. Well, okay, we got a couple of things here. Uh, Monique uh, was on our last webinar, and she just wanted to say love the last webinar, and that she bought the achieving a, pro a productive life. So that's cool. Thank you, Monique. I appreciate that. Uh, Robert, I apologize. I didn't see your question until just now, but I believe the slides have been moving. So I hope you've been seeing the slides. I got word that they were moving. So uh, Robert, hopefully everything's taken care of uh, with regard to that. Um, Johnny, you asked if there are any good books. Now, I, I'm a little bit biased here, but I don't see too many really good books on personal finance. And here's why. Because most of them are pandering to your pleasures. So they want to tell you how you're going to be rich and famous and sipping Mai Tais and driving Ferraris. Most financial stuff is built on stuff like that, and I just don't buy into any of that. I, I'm, I'm here to tell you build a solid plan that's structured around security, comfort, and then freedom. And so I'm obviously biased towards don't just read books and consume more information. You know, Consider our course as an example. Uh, but there are a couple that I would recommend to you. Uh, the first is... Um, uh, by Ramit Sethi. His <laughs> book title is Escaping Me. Shrini, do you happen to know? It's, uh, it's called, I, it's funny because... Oh, I will uh, teach you to be rich. I will teach yes. you to be rich. And it's funny because you mentioned that because literally I was going to say that was the only book, that's the only personal finance book I've ever found useful. Yeah, so I would say if you're new or, or you're just starting out or you're young, he really kind of caters to, to more of the younger uh, generation, uh, I would consider that. The only other one I would consider is a book by Dave Ramsey called Total Money Makeover. If you found yourself in a, in a personal finance hardship or you're struggling with money, you might want to consider that. Uh, but quite frankly, there's just not a lot of good stuff out there. And that's why you know, we've designed this course and we're going to be designing other courses because I, I, just, I feel like we need better education with regard to money. So, Johnny, I hope those are a couple of options for, for you. Um, John asked my views on the direction of the economy. Boy, that's a big subject, John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on that. John, honestly, uh, email me at greg at newmethods.org, and I'd be happy to uh, connect up with you via the phone and possibly have a discussion or even email if, if you prefer that on, on that topic. I don't know that we have enough time to get into that, but I, gotta, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I will tell you this, since, since most people here are business owners, I'll give you one, two tidbits that I think are really, well, three that I think are really important. Number one is social, and I don't mean social media. I mean social business. How are, how are you being social with your business? How are you really being personable and direct? You know, I, to I firmly believe in a high-tech world, high-touch wins. So from an economy standpoint and from your business standpoint, I think that the more high-touch you can be, the better you will be, and that's why I just told you to email me directly so I can talk to you more. Uh, number two, access over ownership is taking over things. So if you own a business, consider about how you're providing access to things, not necessarily just direct ownership. Simple example. We've learned that not all of us need to have a lawnmower that sits in our garage 29 out of 30 days a month. 
we know that if we had access to a lawnmower once a month or once a week, that would be better than one sitting, you know, sitting in our garage that we paid full price for. Uh, uh, cars. I mean, you look at Zipcar, you look at uh, Airbnb, you look at all these companies, you look at YouTube, you look at all these companies that are giving you access to some iTunes, Pandora, Spotify. All of those are access over ownership type companies. Our economy is definitely going in that direction, access over ownership. Um, and I had a third thing, but then now it's kind of escaping me. Oh, the third thing is consider a purpose-driven business. You'll notice that the businesses that are going to start doing really success, successful have some sort of purpose built in, baked in to their business model. They're not just donating 1% of their profits to some nonprofit anymore. They're built in or baked in. You look at companies like Zappos, you know, with their whole mission to, to make the world more happy. You get companies like Tom Shoes, who has a one for one. You buy one for us, we give a pair of shoes to somebody who, in need who doesn't have shoes. That's built in, it's baked in. So I know that's not just pure economic things, but that's more about business things, John. But I would say, you know, those are three economic trends that are happening. Uh, the, the, the fourth is uh, more co uh, cost-saving type things, um, you know, products that are, are cheaper are, are becoming better. You know, one of the reasons that we, we offer our courses for 35 bucks is just that very reason. Education should be more available to more people. I know, without question, we could charge at least 10 times, if not a lot more, for our courses, but we don't do it. And we don't do it because we don't need to do it, and it needs to be available to more people.